The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, be careful for nothing. That's the reading of the King James Version. The word careful simply means anxious. Be anxious for nothing. Or, to put it another way, don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. From someone who was looking, may have been looking at Paul uh, from a different perspective, and were acquainted with this letter and what Paul had to say to his Philippian brethren, they might have thought that to be very, very strange coming from the pen of the Apostle Paul. Because you see, at the time of this writing, the Apostle Paul was in prison. And those prisons in those days and that culture were basically dungeons. He was in prison. And the time of his trial was approaching, and he didn't know what the outcome was going to be. But he urged his brethren don't worry about anything. He wasn't concerned about the outcome of his trial. He wasn't worried at all. You get a better glimpse, a better idea of, of Paul's mindset when you read the, his letter to the Philippians in its entirety. Because you go back to chapter 1, and you read of the depth of his commitment when he says, For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he went on to tell his brethren that he was in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. But he told them, It is more needful for you if I remain in the flesh. He said, But what I shall choose, I know not. And just a little later in that same, uh, a little later in that same letter to the Philippians, he said in Philippians 4 and verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So you have uh, words of encouragement there and words of exhortation. And Paul even repeats it by way of emphasis. Rejoice in the Lord and always. And again, I say rejoice. And so Paul was very happy. He had a great joy of heart. Did he have problems? Yes, he did. There's not an individual who is not living and has lived who's not had problems to one degree or another. And sometimes those problems can seem to be overwhelming. Someone used an illustration to describe it this way, that uh, it's sometimes somewhat like a man who is standing between two tall buildings. And so he looks up and he can only see a, a small, narrow stretch of sky above those buildings. Then a small cloud passes over and from his perspective, it would appear that the entire sky is covered with clouds. Not really. And so even though our problems can seem to be overwhelming, we need to look to the Word of God to understand the need for faith. And to understand the, the uh, the reality that God is in control, that He is on His throne, and that He cares for His own. We need to remember our relationship with God and the fact that the Scriptures teach over and over again of God's concern and His care and His love, and He has a special relationship, of course, with His people. He providentially, in a general way, takes care of mankind in the sense that he provides 
things in the natural realm, such as uh, the sunshine and the rain. But as children of God, we enjoy a special relationship with Him. And so the idea that we're going to look at this evening has to do with worry or anxiety. Don't worry about anything. What is the antidote to that? Is there an antidote to it? There may be some people <clears throat> who may view this, this study, this lesson, who might wonder, where is the antidote? What is the answer? What is the solution? Is there a solution? The problems that I have are totally overwhelming to me. And I have nowhere to turn. So what is the answer? Well, we go to the Word of God. Let's think about this for a few moments. First of all, you have in verse 6 of Philippians 4 the prohibition. And this prohibition is, in nothing be anxious. In other words, as we said a moment ago, don't worry about anything. Now, this is an unconditional command. And we'll see exactly why it is a command and why it's an unconditional command in just a few moments. But first and foremost, we have to understand that this is a command from God. But this is not the only command that's been given in His Word prohibiting His people from being anxious or worried. Jesus, on a number of occasions, urged His own disciples not to worry, not to be anxious. Just shortly before His death, He said in John chapter 14, Let not your hearts be troubled. And they were anxious at that point in time because they knew that the time for the Lord's death was rapidly approaching. And he had told them that he was going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. They were heart sick over that. And, and so it was approaching and they were anxious. They were, to use the term that we use often, they were worried about those events that were going to take place. Worry is prevalent in our society. And we look no further than the television screen every day at the various news segments to be able to see that worry, that anxiety is prevalent. And if you look at some of these news segments, you can easily see how much of the news is negative in nature. And so we read about shootings and murders and, and uh, beatings and robberies and, and things that, uh, that are negative in nature. And so from the standpoint of these things being prevalent in our society, they would tend to cause anxiety. But not just from the standpoint of watching the news reports, even, even in our own communities, and even in our own lives, there are things that, that happen to us and things that we go through, things that our own families go through, which have a tendency to cause anxiety. And so the bottom line is, we want answers. We want the answer. We want the antidote. How do we overcome this? What, what do we do? What is the answer to this? Well, as we look at this, one of the first things that we have to understand has to do with the folly of anxiety. If you're worried about various things in life, first and foremost, I need to understand that it's not going to accomplish anything for me to work. And it makes no difference what you may be talking about. It makes no difference how serious a situation may be. Now, some would say, and, and, and there no doubt is some truth in this, is that in this, that there's a fine line sometimes between worry and concern. Certainly we could be concerned about something, and there are things that we should be concerned about. And if we're concerned about various and sundry things, then we need to do what we can do 
to try and change those things. And we need to also understand that there is a limit to what we can do. And that's where faith comes in. And having the understanding that God is in control. Jesus taught his disciples against worry in the sixth chapter of the book of Matthew. And he asked them the question, by, and, and this is the terminology, terminology he used in, in the uh, translation of the King James. He said, uh, take no thought for tomorrow. Don't worry about things that might happen tomorrow. And then he asked them the question, uh, by taking thought for tomorrow, can you add one cubit to your stature? Is it going to change anything? If you feel like you're too short, if you worry about it, is it going to make you any taller? Well, that's basically the point he was making there. You can't change anything by worry. You can't change anything by anxiety. As a matter of fact, anxiety, worry, will have a negative impact upon every individual. It will have a negative impact mentally, psychologically, it will even have a negative impact physically. Because, have you ever thought about the fact that it takes energy, physical energy, to worry about something? And so what you're doing then is using energy, exerting energy from mentally, and you're wasting that energy. James writes in James chapter 1, Verses 5 through 7. And the context there is writing about wisdom. And it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. But then he goes on to say, But let him ask in faith, nothing doubting. For he that doubteth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. This man is a double minded man and unstable in all of his ways. And so, what James is saying is the one who worries is demonstrating a lack of faith in God. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But even when Jesus was instructing His disciples, and when they were following Him, and as the time was rapidly approaching for His, for, for his death to take place, His death on the cross, there in John 14, I mentioned verse 1 a moment ago. When he told them, let not your heart be troubled. And, and then he went on to say, uh, I'll go and prepare a place for you and come again and receive you unto myself. Now, that's verses 1 and 2 of John 14. You drop down to verse 27, and there he tells them, my peace I give unto you. Now listen to, listen to this. My peace I give unto you. That's the same kind of peace that Paul mentioned in Philippians 4, verse 7. And we'll talk about that in a moment if, if, as we close out the study. But it's the very same kind of peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, but my peace I give unto you. Paul describes it as being peace that passes all understanding. Now here's, something, here's something that we need to understand about this. Having faith in God does not necessarily mean that we will be problem-free, trouble-free. The apostles knew that. They knew that firsthand. Paul knew that firsthand, even as he was writing uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. He well understood that. And as a matter of fact, in our text is Philippians 4, 6, and 7. You drop down just a few verses. Verses uh, 10, uh, 11 and 12. He says, I have, I have learned that in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Because there were going to be times that, from a physical standpoint, things were not going to be so good. And he already had a thorn in the flesh. Something that, would, that he was struggling with physically. And, and it was, in fact, uh, he, he begged the Lord, and that's the, word, that's the meaning of the word be soft in 2 Corinthians 12. He begged the Lord to remove it. 
And when the Lord refused to move it, saying to remove it, saying, My grace is sufficient for you, Paul accepted that. He, this is what he did. When the Lord refused to remove that thorn in the flesh, Paul applied Philippians 4.11. That's incredible. He applied I have lived and that it, I have learned that in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. And so Paul wrote concerning that thorn, and he said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And he went on to say, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions. Not everyone can say that. Not every one of us can say that, that we take pleasure or rejoice in those things that are bad, that happen to us. But that's what he said. I take pleasure in these things. And then he gave the reason for it. He said, for when I am weak, then am I strong. And that took faith. And you have some of play on words there. When I am weak, that is weak physically because of the thorn in the flesh, then am I strong, strong spiritually because the power of Christ would rest upon him. And the Lord would give him the strength and the grace that he needed in order to be able to endure that. So even having faith doesn't necessarily mean that everything will always go exactly as, as we want it to go. Now, look at the cause of anxiety. The bottom line is a lack of faith in God. You think about the songs that we sang a few moments ago. Songs having to do with faith and the care and the concern that God exercises over us. Paul wrote in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are the call according to His purpose. Listen to this. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord and lean not to your own understanding. Let me tell you, there are a lot of things that happen to us in life. Realistically, some of us would have to say, I, just, I don't understand this. I don't understand why I'm going through this. I, I just... And then again, that has to do with our, the fact that we are finite beings. There are some things that we cannot comprehend. But in the words of the wise man, look, that's okay. Don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Here you have the promise. And He will direct your paths. Great promise from God. And then, of course, Matthew chapter 6. When Jesus speaks of the physical necessities of life, he's telling his disciples, don't worry about those things. But they'll providentially be provided. All right, now, you have the prohibition then. Don't worry about anything. Here you have the precept given next. Let your request be made known unto God. All right. That's the antidote. Someone says, well, that's, that's too simple. Well, it really is simple. But it takes faith to be able to apply it. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, Peter says, casting all your, here you have that word care again, all you, uh, in King James and Philippians 4, 6, it's careful, be careful for nothing. When Peter says, casting all your care, he's, he's saying anxiety. Casting all your anxiety upon Him. Why? Because He cares for you. That's something that we need to think about day in and day out. God cares for me. Maybe it's something we need to say to ourselves over and over and over again. God cares for me. He cares for me more than, than I could ever even comprehend. He cares. In the words of the song a few moments ago, 
take it to the Lord in prayer. Whatever problems there are, take it to the Lord in prayer. We have to open up our hearts to God. Lay, lay bare our hearts before God. In three areas here. First of all, prayer in general. If I have faith in God, then I'm a praying Christian. And you see, a faithful Christian is a, a praying Christian. We rely on prayer. Pray without ceasing. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17. Prayer is to be a part of our lives. A part of our spiritual life. As much as food is for the physical body. You see, where the Christian is concerned, there will not be a day that goes by. And really, even several times during the day in which we will not pray to God. Why? Because of who we are. Children of Almighty God. And so we pray to Him. We communicate. Supplication, Paul said, uh, with supplication. And the word supplicate, supplication simply means to ask or to beg. You know, sometimes, uh, <clears throat> sometimes there are things that we, that we suffer. And it may be that we are in such tremendous mental anguish that we don't even know what, what to ask God for. Have you ever felt that way? You just don't know what, you know you have a need, but you don't know what to ask Him for. And if you did, many of us would say, well, I don't even know how to ask. I don't and there are times that we go through periods like that when we have severe struggles that are taking place in our lives. Look at this. God takes care of that. Because in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, Paul writes about the, about the Holy Spirit being our intercessor, translating groans within the child of God Translating those to God or taking those to God groans which cannot be uttered. That's one of the works of the Holy Spirit being our intercessor. And so here's what you've got. It may be that I am hurting so bad and I am going through such severe struggles. It may be that the only thing that I can say, the only thing I know to say is God help me. Please God help me. So the Holy Spirit takes those groanings and interprets those to the Father. It gives me chills to think about that. What a great blessing. And Paul said, with thanksgiving, Thanksgiving for blessings that we've received from God. But not only that, thanksgiving for the opportunity to communicate with God about our troubles. Knowing that He's listening. It's not just that He hears our prayer. <clears throat> He's listening intently. He wants to hear from us. He wants to hear our prayers. Whatever is hurting us, he wants us to take it to Him. He wants that. And again, that's a great blessing just to know. And then finally, you have the result. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God. Let me tell you something as we close out the study. Paul had that peace. All right. Now, and I know I've said this before, but there 
there had to have been those who were leading Paul to his execution site who saw that peace in him but did not understand it. You know, you, when those the soldiers, the officials, saw other prisoners that they had led to their execution sites and, and, uh, and had beheaded them, you know, there may very well and likely were those who, were, who would be kicking and screaming and trying to escape, begging for their lives not to, for their lives to be spared. But not Paul. Not Paul. Because he wrote to Timothy, I am ready to be offered. That's that peace that passes understanding. I'm ready. And the reason that I'm ready is I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. And I've kept the faith. So I'm ready. Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. Look at this. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Isn't that comforting? In the Lord Jehovah, there's everlasting strength. And then Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, you know. Let your conversation or your manner of life be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now that's a promise from God. Let me tell you something. In our darkest hour, He's watching over us. And some of us can, I mean, we can identify with that. Perhaps being so troubled, and on occasion when I've gotten up in the middle of the night, gone into another room and got down on my knees to pray. It was just me and God. He's there. Listening. Concerned. And caring. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. He is my helper. He's my strength. He's my refuge. He is my hope. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. The antidote, trust in the Lord with all our hearts. Place our faith in Him, knowing that He is in control. There may be someone here who is not a New Testament Christian. We encourage you to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter instructed those on Pentecost in Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. If you're not a Christian, then we encourage you to obey those words, obey those instructions, and therein become a child of God. If you're unfaithful to the Lord, then be restored to your first love tonight. And what a great great feeling in it from a spiritual standpoint and, and in every other aspect to know that that you're faithful to the Lord. You're not perfect but you're faithful. You know that we trust in a God who cares for us and who's concerned who watches over his own and who providentially cares for us in our lives. You're subject to heaven's invitation.